it hadn't been for Lookout Point and Gordon McGinnis, uh, I wouldn't have had this wonderful journey through golf and uh, I suppose ending up in the World Golf Hall of Fame and many other nice things. Uh, I thank Lookout Point for that. In the early 1900s, an architect by the name of Walter Travis hopped the border and stamped his unique design style on Canadian soil, first at Lookout Point and second at Cherry Hill. They may be close on a map, but these two clubs boast their own brilliant distinctions and have become two of the top courses in the country. This is the Walter Weekend. So maybe we can start just by talking a little bit about what makes Lookout so great. The view, <laughs> that's the first one. And I've been here 31 years and still this morning took a picture of the sunrise. I took a picture of you watching the sunrise. <laughs> I'll show you later. <laughs> there are lots of examples of certain architects but there's almost no examples of others and with both Lookout Point and Cherry Hill they're amazing examples of uh, Walter Travis's work. You couldn't replace this golf course. You can find some land somewhere, bulldozers and all that and then create a golf course but nature actually created this golf course. I think uh, you've got to play a ton of different shots and I think that's kind of why a lot of players came out of here good players because of all the all the shots that you have to learn how to hit otherwise you know you're not going to score well. I'm surprised I'm you recognize me. Like, this is a while ago. We haven't um, dated, have we? <laughs> <laughs> no, but oh, uh, my, son, my first individual one on one lesson was with you. Get right. out of town. with the men there you know was was great for me because they you know those little bitty greens and of course you know I'd I miss a lot of greens so I had to chip and putt because I didn't want to be losing my nickel I didn't have a nickel to lose have you ever heard of a course that anywhere in the world that has 200 years <laughs> People don't talk about it. No, we, nobody knows the game. We, we don't understand the same the game, game. But nobody knows what it is. <laughs> nobody ever pays. Yeah. You know, we haven't talked about some of the golfers that have produced out of this golf club. But it started with Ann Sharp, who sort of tutored Marlene Stewart Street. And then we've had a lot of junior golfers that have gone away on golf scholarships down to the States. There's a number of young ladies. That Kathy Shirk. Kathy yeah. Sure. And you won the U.S. Women's Am in 78 or 79? 78. 78. Yeah. So you'd been here for six years before you could win a national title south of the border. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you remember about that week? And what did you take from Lookout uh, to the Women's Am? Well, I, well, I was runner up the year before, which was good experience wise. So when I went and it was in Sunnybrook in Philadelphia and the course, it was very similar to Lookout, which was really kind of cool because it was it was uh, narrow fairways, small greens, hilly. So I felt like, oh man, this is going to be pretty good, you know. 
and match play is the best. I mean, it's really, each hole is like a whole new tournament. So, and we were taught that, Marlene taught us that, that match play is like one hole at a time, one, and it's like one game at a time. And I've only played golf for, well, it's 70, 71 years since I won the first of 11 Canadian championships. 71 years. Uh, she did come back, uh, give or take, six years ago and wanted a lesson from Gord Jr. and came out to the range and she hit, I'm going to say, five, five woods and she only had to fix two ball marks because three of them hit the same spot. You know, that's, that's how precise she was. Kathy and I often talk about that, like how fortunate were we? Maybe what I learned most at, at uh, Lookout was, uh, was, was the chipping and putting. And, and, and you know, Gord stressed that too. He'd just say, come on, let's chip, or come on, let's putt. And I didn't even know what he was doing, but you know, he knew. I was learning how to compete and I didn't even know it. But he gave me excellent basics. I always had a good grip. I would never go and practice without asking him if my grip was okay. Then I'd go. And I'd win a championship and come home and I'd be, you know, sort of full about everything. And I'd go up the next morning and he'd say to me, well, you did really well. But he said, get your shag bag and go and practice for the next one. And that was the end of it. We never did a big long, oh, what did you do? Oh, well, that was great. I mean, I didn't even know how good I was. If I was, I don't know, I'm not sure. And do I have a favorite hole at the lookout point? You know what, I got 18 of them, but I love that first hole. When you stand on the first tee, you're kind of you don't know what to say or what to do at that point. Uh, in my mind, the, the best opening hole in Canada is the first hole at Lookout Point. And I think it also speaks to the nature of the golf course as well. You stand up there and you realize everything is on a grand scale. That there's actually, uh, everything's bigger and bolder and, and wider than just about any golf course. And there are moments where I think Travis was smart enough to just let the holes kind of roll across that landscape and rather than over detailing it sometimes he's smart enough to get out of the way and let the land be the, the star so then my mother would make sure i you know stayed and did the whatever i had to do in the morning chores at home and you know i wanted to go to the golf course <laughs> so but anyway and i had a hole in one on the second hall there in, uh, in uh, let me see, 1949. Oh, I don't know, just all, and I was playing with, with Ralphie McGinnis that day, Gord's younger brother, because he was caddy too, and made this hole in one on number two. But first of all, I hit a three iron, 127 yards. <laughs> and we we couldn't find the ball. We looked all over, couldn't find the ball. So we so then we looked in the hole. Of course, two kids. Uh, boom! There it was. Woo. We grabbed our bags and ran back up the hill to tell Gord had a hole in one. He said, "Well, it doesn't count if you don't play the hole 18." Man, we ran back down that hill, teed off on three. <laughs> if you take dead aim in that bunker and, and hit it with a little bit of crunch, you're actually gonna find a, 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 a very receptive slope and it'll control where it goes. The trick is the next one. Okay, so, so you're coming in maybe with a three iron, so the shot is to really high, land it just past the pin and suck it back. I think that's, <laughs> yeah, I that think is that's the it. Shot. That's Has the any shot. one of us no ever trouble. done that? And there's no trouble right or left. Yeah. Well, so it's, you, a, it's yeah. actually a pretty easy shot. I think that shot is deceivingly hard because the green is 2,800 square feet. It's maybe the smallest green I work with in all of the golf courses I've ever worked on. It falls off on both sides and 
You're never in line with it, which means you're coming at an off angle, which means essentially only 60% of the greens going to receive your shot. I remember standing on 4T, seeing Mike's approach shot. <laughs> just airmail this green, and it is absolute yeah. jail. Yeah. I was optimistic. I was like, I can still make a five. I, just, I think I can. So. Yeah, I think like, I could not make too. a five. <laughs> The whole entire time you play lookout point, you need to be aware of where the highest point is and know that that's actually the biggest influence on reading greens. So you'll stand on the fourth green in particular, is probably one of the worst ones, where you look at it and because everything's so bold and so strong, it looks like it's actually falling back into the slopes. And it's not, it's still falling really hard to the left. It's what hold you fear. And it started with number five, which got you yeah, because it's a short hole but it's got greenside bunkers both sides. The green is the size of a card table yep. with quite a bit of slope to it. Especially and right. you miss that, you miss that green and you're looking at bogey. Yeah, yeah, yeah no one's flying eating. into the back. Yeah, they, <laughs> members, members know the land. Members know going. what to do. Yeah. I love number five. <laughs> <laughs> Oh! <laughs> yeah! Stop it! How did that happen? Thank you, Lord. What a shot. That so amazing. don't go long. <laughs> but if you do, you can just hold Sweet. it. Yeah, but Sweet. if you do. Nice birdie. <laughs> Routine. First take. You know, First take. You know what they say, ball hole when trophy go home. <laughs> That's so good. Six is probably the hardest tee shot, maybe the hardest hole, and the reason being is it's almost impossible to hit the fairway. Uh, to hit the fairway, you've... There's one way you can play it. If you play a little bit of a draw, you can get the ball onto the left-hand side. You've got to learn to play a little shorter than you think. It's a hole where restraint's actually rewarded. And then the green works the same way. It, it's a green where uh, front plateau should be the only place you ever play for. If you're into the, the swale, as long as it's not on the fly, that's fine. But the back plateau is not meant to be hit. So the crease green is a really common element. I would say it's unusual not to find one. There. Here we go. Here's the fun begin. I knew I didn't hit it. Oh, wow. Way. Oh, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> back to back. So for the record, that's like seven, eight inches. It's past the hole. Yeah, it's past the hole. And it's in. Nice roll. Seven's not the original green. It was 16th, by the way. Um, that's where the routing flip. Everything falls obviously super hard from right to left and it, it really more than anything else, you can kind of ignore the bunkers. You've just got to try to work out where you can get yourself into a good position. And then the irony of all ironies is that is the one green that does not fall with the land. And so if you don't know, you've gone six holes of trying to figure this out and then you get to that green and usually you misread that putt. The eighth is, is just because it's so uphill, very few people have the ability to um, hit the type of shot they need to hit. It's long, it's very intimidating, and it seems to be one of those holes where people end up on the side slopes. And so because of the nature of the green, it's really hard to get up and down because everything's sliding so hard again to the valley. So it just, it, it's the one I think that sort of tortures people the most.
The very first time you ever take anybody to play Lookout, you go to the first tee and everybody's, you know, they, they see Niagara Falls and they're, they're, they kind of lose their breath for a split second. And you get to do it again. The fun about 10 is, um, it, it took me a while to figure out, if you can find the very first part of the fairway with an iron, it's got such a hard kicker slope, you can actually, that will finish the same distance down the hole as a driver will for me. I, I find the kicker slope is that strong. And then that green is just, it's all or nothing. Can't be long. The interesting thing about the 11th hole is the 11th hole is hard for everybody um, because you have to be laser straight. Um, if you draw or fade the ball, there's no advantage of actually hitting either of those shots. You don't want to miss left and you've got the out of bounds on the right and actually all of those misses are terrible. It's one of those holes you've just kind of, kind of got to survive. It may be the, the hardest of all the threes, really. Twelfth hole, is that the par five? That's where it started to, to disappear and it, there was no coming back from it too. So it wears you down, it's a, it's a brute of a test. What do you think the hardest hole on the course is? For most people, it's probably 13, you know, where they have to carry a tee shot to a, to a plateau that, and, and you can't hit it right, you're in the trees. And then it leaves you with no second shot. So now you're trying to get on in three. So for the average golfer, I, I think 13 is probably a tough one. For me, the thing about 13 that's special is those mounds across the second landing area. So it's a joy for me seeing an architect do something that nobody else will that's really cool. Uh, very difficult hole because it climbs way more than people think it does. There's actually a really large elevation change that you just can't pick up because the land rolls up and back down and up again. And what you're missing is you're actually climbing the whole way. And so I think people really struggle to, to find the right club because they don't know how much elevation changes actually in the second shot. 14 is just a flat hole along the end of the property. Hit the drive down the middle, hit the second shot straight, and I was usually short of that, of that dip you do, and then hit the ball in the green. What else is there to do? Um, one of the interesting aspects of Lookout Point is it finishes with 15, 16, 17, and 18, and none of them being long fours. They're all actually on the shorter side. And a lot of people, when they look at the scorecard, um, see that as an opportunity to score at the end. And the funny part is it, it's, there's a lot of hanging on at the end. The 15th is um, very delicate. You've really got to be precise. What's the right decision off the 16th tee? Okay. Oh, that's a great question. Um, that may be the best question of all because I can't answer that. Um, and I'd, I've never met anybody who had any success with a driver. So because everything kind of cuts back against the slope, they all seem to hit it through and then end up with that awkward pitch from the rough. The margin for error, because there's so much crossfall in the fairway and the bunkers, the, the three bunkers are lined up right on that edge that you'd probably need to hit to, to find some success. If you're playing down that edge, if you just miss, you're gonna end up there and then you're between shots, which is terrible. And they're actually pretty deep little bunkers. And they're, they're definitely um, based off of um, some work at Garden City. And then the 17th is a little more uphill and a little, it, it looks a little um, mild by card, but you're starting to work your way back up the slope and then you're really gonna climb it on 18. But I find a lot of people under club and it's one of the more interesting green sites. Um, 
It's got a lot more crossfall than you can see. It looks like it's just benched in like the seventh green, but it's not. It actually slides a little bit on you. So it's one of those ones where you never seem to make a putt. And then you turn, you've got 18, you're thinking, oh, I can probably hit a driver there, which is fool's paradise. Worst thing you can do is hit a driver there because the way everything narrows and the land forms, if you hit a driver, your margin for error is about the size of a coffee table. And you don't want to get in any of the bunkers anywhere around there. And it, it, that's a hole for a restraint. But the other biggest problem with it is if you get too close to it and you're, you hit a spinning shot, you could hit the back of the green and actually spin it right off the front end of the front bunker. The green is probably the steepest green on the golf course. It's really borderline on whether it's too steep for today's modern uh, conditions. The worst spot to be on the entire golf course is the back edge of the green in the rough on the down slope because I don't even think you can throw a ball from there and keep it on the green. Now here, right from the first tee to 18th green pot, you know, you've got to put 100% into it, otherwise you're paying money. <laughs> Whether it's Scarborough with Tillinghast, um, St. Charles, where you've got the only Mackenzie, I think any time an architect is, is given the good fortune to work with these clubs, the one thing that should stand out more than anything else is that they should um, show a lot of deference to the work or a lot of respect for the work. And so it, for me, it was super rewarding to give, given the chance to um, do preservation and restoration with both golf courses. I don't know. It's just, it's just something most about your the good game. friendships are mine anyway. Yeah. Have come from golf. Yeah. That's the most important part of the game. Yeah. Well, aside from that, golf is misery, disappointment, <laughs> disenchantment, <laughs> but occasionally it's rewarding. And it would have to be to stick at it for sixty years, like I have. So. And it's a metaphor for life. Yeah. You know, if your kids come out here and learn golf, they learn they shouldn't cheat. You don't cheat. You're, you're your own referee or your own umpire. And those valuable lessons about character and morality, I think you can learn on the golf course. doesn't make sense when I talk about it because people don't believe it. it's got to be a lot more complicated than that. Well, it's not. It really isn't. You can make it a lot more complicated. I mean, I never thought about where my left arm was or anything. It was pretty natural just to do it right. If you gripped it right, you could do the other stuff. If you had a lousy grip, it was hard to do the other stuff. Nothing could follow through, just figure it out. No? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Stop this! <laughs>